Hello everyone, I'm Tomáš Tupita from the Institute of International Relations Prague and I would like to cordially welcome you to this online conference about gender in foreign policy. This conference aims to stimulate a discussion about the practical dimension of reflecting on gender in foreign policy. In the last three decades, we have witnessed a global spread and rhetorical acceptance of the ideal of gender equality. But we have also seen that it is quite a challenge to put this ideal into practice. In this situation, it is more than relevant to go beyond the rhetoric and inquire about the everyday and institutional aspects of advancing international gender norms in practice. This task is made even more urgent with the recent global backlash on women's rights and the exceptional conditions of the global pandemic. We should ask what concrete mechanisms, setups or procedures can contribute towards a meaningful and visible change in the practices of foreign policy? How can we go from words to deeds? This conference presents us with three panel discussions that focus on three specific segments of foreign policy, namely on the women, peace and security agenda, then on women's empowerment and gender equality in development cooperation, and then on the international dimension of tackling gender-based equality, uh, gender-based violence, and supporting sexual and reproductive rights. But before we will enjoy the interactive discussions with our guests, we will have the pleasure to follow the opening remarks of the Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tomáš Petříček, and of the Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office in Germany, Michel Müntefering. The initial remarks will be followed by a keynote speech from Professor Anne Towns. So with no more delay, I would like to invite Minister Petricek to present us with his opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to address you at the opening of this important event, focus on the gendered uh, foreign policy in practice. The timing of the conference is quite fitting as we find ourselves now amidst the 16 days of uh, activism against gender-based uh, violence organized by the UN, which uh, the Czech Republic proudly participates in. This year, we commemorate uh, many significant benchmarks and uh, anniversaries in the field of gender equality, or indeed uh, equality in general. It has been 75 years since the creation of the United Nations, 25 years since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and 20 years since the adoption of the Security Council Resolution 1325, which place women's participation uh, to the very core of conflict prevention and resolution. Commitment uh, by the international community to promote women's uh, rights, gender equality and full participation of uh, women in decision-making processes have been evolving continuously for more than 20 years. However, we still live in a world where women face neglect or even exclusion from political and peace processes. Indeed, uh, this sobering reality has been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemics, which has not only deepened the pre-existing inequalities, but also in many ways jeopardized the fragile progress that has been made in some areas. Mainstreaming of gender agenda and fathering of uh, the women, peace and security agenda remain one of the priorities of the Czech Republic. As we speak, uh, two important uh, documents are being approved by our government and shall be adopted by the end of this year. It is the Government Strategy for Equality of uh, Women and Men for 2021 till 2030 and the second National Action Plan on uh, Women, Peace and Security for the years uh, 2021 till 2025. Both documents set out general goals as well as specific car targets and concrete measures to accomplish these targets. Preparation of these documents uh, has been a joint effort of uh, various stakeholders, including the governmental as well as uh, non-governmental actors. 
These documents are our principal national instruments to strengthen and improve monitoring as well as uh, accountability of our progress in implementation of gender and uh, VPS agendas. The Czech Republic also participates in the common efforts of the European Union to strengthen gender equality and empower women in our partner countries. We have taken an active part in the implementation of the last EU gender action plans and we will continue doing so under the new gender action plan for the years 2021-2025. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, this conference will bring new interesting impulses and incentives to finding innovative ways of how to achieve our goals in the field of gender equality. I wish you fruitful and successful discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank Minister Petricek for situating the Czech foreign and domestic policy in the European and international context. Also, I would like to wholeheartedly thank him and the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their support to this conference. The political and institutional support to this agenda is of extreme importance. And now we are getting to the following opening remarks, which will be from the Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office in Germany, Michel Müntefering. Dear Minister Petricek, dear ladies and gentlemen, progress is a question of priority. When I was born, internet and digitalization were not yet determining our daily lives. Driverless cars were still a part of science fiction. So much has changed since then. Technological breakthroughs are made at astonishing speed. And if forecasts are right, we will even live to see manned flights to planet Mars. How come that it takes so much longer to overcome societal barriers? How come that gender parity will most likely not be achieved during our lifetimes? nor in our children's. In its yearly gender gap report, the World Economic Forum looks at the average progress worldwide. And its last edition concluded it will take around 100 more years to finally reach gender parity. A whole century. That is if progress continues to crawl at a snail's pace as it currently does. What does it tell us about the priorities of those who currently hold power in politics, economy and society? I think it shows it's still a man's world. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 should have been a year full of celebrations. In the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the 20th anniversary of the groundbreaking UN Resolution 1325, as well as the 10th anniversary of UN Women. This year should have been a year about greater gender justice. Instead, 2020 has shown in times of crisis like this one, women Women and girls still carry the largest burden. Due to the pandemic, the gender gap in low wages and unemployment, health care and education has again widened. Domestic violence has surged. In addition, the implementation of the WPS agenda continues to be weak. Too often, women are still excluded from peace processes. Too often their rights and interests continue to be ignored when building post-conflict societies. Too often conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence remains unpunished. As a global community, we have not lived up to our commitment. Even worse, we have been witnessing a global pushback on women's rights over the last few years. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the advancement of women's and girls' rights, there is no question. To give up is not an option. Women's rights are human rights. They are not 
negotiable. Therefore, current obstacles and setbacks are a call for action, a call to redouble our efforts and to do better. Germany is focusing on three main areas. Multilateral engagement, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas has made the WPS agenda one of our top priorities as non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Together with our partners, we are pushing for gender equality to be mainstreamed in all UN activities. The adoption of Resolution 2467 under the German Security Council presidency on ending sexual violence in conflicts in April 2019 was an important step. Now we must all make sure the resolution is implemented on the ground. Also on the EU level we committed to gender equality together with like-minded countries. We are able to ensure that gender equality is a key component of the EU action plan for human rights and democracy. Even if there were very diverging views initially supporting to civil society. Civil society is crucial. If we want to advance gender equality, we have to involve civil society actors, provide sufficient funding and protect human rights defenders. Therefore, we are proud to have been co-initiator of the African Women Leaders Network, which supports women in the transformation of Africa, especially in the areas of governance, peace and stability. The German Latin American network, UNIDAS, founded in 2019, also promotes networking and supports feminist projects by Latin American organizations. And Germany also plays a key role as the second largest donor and board member of the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund. Moreover, we are realizing many projects with civil society on the ground, 50 alone in 2020, from providing shelter for women peace activists in Afghanistan to increasing the participation of women peace activists in Libya. Raising awareness and leading by example in German. There is the saying, those who live in the glass houses shouldn't throw stones. It's important that we ourselves live up to our aspiration. The Federal Foreign Office has undertaken substantial efforts to raise the percentage of women in the German diplomatic service, including leadership positions. Our vision is to make gender equality part of our DNA, and therefore we are creating WPS focal points in our embassies, and we are mainstreaming the gender perspective into our entire foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow we celebrate St. Nicholas Day in Germany. It is a tradition on that day the children write their Christmas wishes, which are collected and hopefully come true on 24th of December. My wish list would read first full implementation of resolution 1325, second, pushback, the pushback, and third, the inclusion of gender aspects in all efforts to build back better after the COVID crisis, including distribution of financial resources. But it is a wish list that does not come true by simply sitting and waiting for the present to arrive by reindeers. It needs active engagement from all of us. I am convinced we will not have to wait for 100 years if we finally make gender parity our priority. Big thanks to the Minister of State, Mitu Fering, for her introduction to the German engagement with gender parity and equality in foreign policy. I completely subscribe to her wish list concerning the Women, Peace and Security agenda, the pushback against the pushback, and the post-COVID recovery. Let's make gender parity our priority in our domestic and foreign policies. Uh, now we have finished our section of initial remarks, and we can go straight to the keynote speech.
The keynote contribution will be presented by Anne Towns, Professor of Political Science at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Her contribution will focus on gender patterns in, some would argue, the most important institutions in the contemporary international relations, the Ministries of Foreign Affairs. Hello, um, my name is Anne Towns. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, where I run a research program called GenDip that focuses on gender and diplomacy. And before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this really terrific event. I'm really looking forward to this interesting day. Okay, so you, as you probably know, diplomacy used to be an all male affair with only men involved. But today, an increasing number of women are entering the profession. This is a huge change, of course, and something to celebrate as a victory, not least for meritocracy. If we want the best, the brightest, and the most suitable individuals to enter foreign affairs, it makes no sense to bar half the population a priori by having rules that say that only men may take foreign service exams, only men may serve as diplomats. So this is a victory then for merit-based professionalism in public administration that women are now allowed to join. It's also a victory for fairness and justice. As a matter of principle, it should be a given that women have the same rights and opportunities for a career in foreign affairs as do men. But the question of meritocracy and fairness, they're not resolved simply because women are now allowed to pursue a diplomatic career. We now need to ask, what are the conditions for these women and for men in diplomacy? So for the next 25 minutes or so, I will talk about what we know from existing research about gender patterns and the conditions for men and women in ministries for foreign affairs. And to start with, let me point out that there have been huge changes over time in the rules and divisions of labor between men and women in diplomacy. And these changes have not taken place in isolation within individual countries. There are global patterns to these exclusions and inclusions of women. So what are some of these historical trends? Well, let's start with a period, a period just prior to the 19th century. So at that time, um, there was a lot of political diversity in the world. There were not only states, right? But there were lots of other kinds of polities. There were empires, tribes, bands, and so forth. In many non-European societies, women played an important role in diplomacy. Among European states, diplomacy was carried out by members of the aristocracy at this time and by people close to the royal courts. And women who are part of these elite strata also played important diplomatic roles. They were rarely ambassadors or diplomats in a formal sense, but they were trained in languages, they were trained in formal letter writing, and they performed all kinds of diplomatic functions. Then during the 19th century, diplomacy professionalized. Modern bu bureaucratic ministries of foreign affairs developed with civil servant exams, etc. This was in a sense, bad news for women initially. Because as diplomacy professionalized, bans were put in place that barred women from taking civil service exams and from serving as diplomats. And that meant that diplomacy professionalized with only men as official diplomats. And the 19th century was also a, a period of European colonial expansion, which meant that diplomacy as a male institution spread around the world. So then in response to these bans, the 20th century saw struggles to allow women to serve as diplomats. And these eventually led to some major changes. So between the 1920s to 1950s, we saw that the previous bans on women were lifted around the world. However, as these bans were lifted, um, marriage bans targeting women dip diplomats were put in place. So women were not allowed to be married if they were to serve as a diplomat. So bear in mind also that male diplomats were expected to marry a woman. He was expected to have a diplomatic wife to assist him with the many duties of diplomacy. But women diplomats, on the other hand, they were not allowed, allowed to marry and keep their job. These bans 
were not lifted until the 1970s. And that's really late, right? But they were finally lifted, which led to a slow uptick in the number of women in diplomacy. And the increase in women in diplomacy, it was pretty slow until the 1990s or so. But in the 2000s, in response to this, a number of states had thus turned to active recruitment efforts, trying to be more proactive in encouraging women to join the diplomatic profession. So now, we have a rapid, a rapid increase across the world in the number of women in diplomacy. And that means that we have a rapidly changing composition of the diplomatic community. Right? So by and large today, right, there are no more formal bans on women, which might lead us to suspect that the problem is solved, right? Well, wrong. Because as it turns out, it's not sufficient simply to add women to an institution that used to be for men only. And while it might seem like these institutions are neutral, they're often modeled on a certain kind of male situation and premised on women performing all kinds of support roles. So today we have ministries of foreign affairs that women are free to join. But as they have joined, they've joined an institution that developed by and for men and new gender patterns seem to have emerged. And research about these gender patterns are ongoing. I mean, there are lots of people now doing work on individual ministries of foreign affairs around the world, but I will tell you a little bit about what we know so far about some of these ministries of foreign affairs. Um, and a main question to ask here, or primary first question to ask when looking at gender and diplomacy is where are the men and the women in the organization? And here, the research is, existing research shows us two basic things. On the one hand, we know that the higher up in the ministries of foreign affairs, the fewer women there are, even proportionate to the overall share in the MFA. Men continue to be overrepresented in the leadership positions and positions with the highest status in MFAs. Second, we also know that there is um, functional differentiation in many ministries of foreign affairs. Men tend to end up in the so-called hard offices focused on security, often politics and trade, whereas women are often overrepresented in offices focusing on human resources, foreign aid, human rights, and often consular work as well. So what if we look at the top positions within, diplo within diplomacy, the ambassador positions? Becoming an ambassador is often the apex in a diplomatic career. Well, one of the things that we do in my agenda program is map ambassadors by gender. And this is really interesting because it allows us to map differences among countries and also changes over time. So we're finishing up now a huge database on this, on the gender of ambassadors and where they're posted, uh, which we hope to make public this winter. But for now, we have analyzed data from 2014. And that data on male and and female ambassador postings in 2014 shows us that only 15% of the world's bilateral ambassadors were women, okay? 15%, that means 85% of ambassadors are still men. That's a huge difference, right? To be sure, there is variation across the world and those variations are perhaps not that surprising, right? The Scandinavian countries send the highest share of women ambassadors, on average 35% in 2014, North America and Oceania are also above average. The Middle East and Asia, on the other hand, send the lowest share of ambassadors. Although you have to say this is changing rapidly because countries like the United, United Arab Emirates are recruiting lots of women to diplomacy. Saudi Arabia just sent their first woman ambassador to Washington DC and so forth. So I expect that the numbers would look quite different actually when they, when they are updated this year. Then we have Africa, South America, and continental Europe, which are about around average, right? It's also important to note here that there are, of course, variations within these regions, right? The regional averages don't tell us everything. In South America, for instance, Colombia has over 30% women ambassadors. Philippines, likewise, has around 30% women ambassadors. So it looks, you know, different within the regions as well. Another question that we have asked if 
is if there are gender patterns, not just in which states send ambassadors, but also where those ambassadors are posted and where men and women are sent to. Not all postings are the same, right? Some are much more important and prestigious than others, for instance. So we've also asked then, where are men and women ambassadors posted? Research here is also still ongoing, but we know a few things. For one, we know that there are hierarchies in ambassador postings, that some postings are more weight and status than others. For instance, postings to capitals in the world's most powerful states in the world, such as DC, uh, London, Beijing, Moscow, Paris, right? Those are the plum postings. And here, women are underrepresented, often far less than the 15% average, right? Um, we also know that there is issue differentiation. On the one hand, men are more likely to be posted to militarized settings, right? Whereas women are more likely to be posted to gender equal settings. And this could be one way in which gender may favor women. Right, because who wouldn't rather be posted perhaps to a gender equal setting than a militarized setting, assuming that those are mutually or, or different contexts. Right, but at the same time, we know that hardship postings are often an important step in a career. So we still don't really know, right, whether this is something that favors women or men or in what ways. Then the next question to ask is why do we see such gender patterns in diplomacy? Why are there these patterns within ministries of foreign affairs and among ambassadors appointments? And here we have many potential answers. Okay, And it's helpful, I think, to think of these answers in terms of two clusters. Each of these answers may have some merit, okay? And there isn't enough research yet to provide a definitive answer about like which one of these is, is um, provides us most answers, right? But we're working on that. So in any case, the first cluster of answers assume that diplomacy itself is gender neutral. So whatever patterns we see in diplomacy, they exist because of factors external to diplomacy in this view. Um, and one of these answers highlights that women are latecomers to diplomacy, okay? The argument here is democracy is, I mean, diplomacy is meritocratic, right? Um, giving men and women the same opportunities to pursue a career. And the, but the reason that we're seeing fewer women in top positions is that they enter diplomacy late, right? With time, they'll be at all levels at proportional rates, right? Well, there's obviously probably some merit to this, right? That we will see more women in top positions as the number of women grows, right, in, diplo in diplomacy. But the main objection to this is that it's now been 50 years, right, since the marriage bans were lifted on women, and we still see women trailing men. What is more, the diplomatic career is a leaky pipeline for women. If we look at cohorts, we see that women leave the profession, are slower to advance, and so forth, relative to men. So why is this, right? Isn't it this indication that something is awry with diplomacy itself? Well, some say that this isn't necessarily an indication that there's gender bias in diplomatic institutions. Instead, they argue this is an effect of broader societal gender roles, right? So some point to the fact that men and women still have very different societal roles and different family roles. For instance, they often have more, women often have more caretaking responsibilities of children and older parents, for instance. The expectations might also be that their career is of secondary importance to the husband's career, right? And it, it's because of these kinds of factors that women trail behind and drop out of the profession to a higher degree than men. There are objections to this line of argument as well, right? Critics claim that this ignores how diplomacy itself relies on gender roles. Diplomacy is not gender neutral, these scholars argue. Instead, diplomacy is deeply shaped by gender roles. And that then takes us to the second cluster of explanations. Explanations that change, um, that sorry, that charge that diplomacy itself is gendered rather than neutral. And among those who argue that diplomacy, that diplomacy is gendered, there are also two main explanations for why women are slower to progress in diplomacy and why there are gender patterns, right? And the first of these explanations focuses on discrimination. 
the argument here is that women face right that women face resistance harassment stereotypes that hinder their careers to the advantage of men right? and there's some merit to, to this right as to the other explanation i mean we do see right indications of dis of discrimination in diplomacy and of homosociality where men are guarding their male only spaces right and that they resist the inclusion of women in those spaces but there are also objections here and one of the main objections is that although some diplomats do point to discrimination many claim never to have really encountered any at all so while discrimination might do some work in explaining why we don't yet have more women, and it might do some work in specific ministries of foreign affairs, because we can assume that this is different in different places, right? This is still not a full explanation for why we see gender patterns and slower uh, career advancements and so forth for women. So then we have another set of answers that instead center on the institution of diplomacy as a masculinized institution. Um, and these people argue that diplomacy is masculinized in the sense that it is modeled on men and men in particular situations, right? Because modern diplomacy developed as an all male institution, diplomacy was made to fit a certain kind of man, a heterosexual man, often of the upper classes, it was married to a woman, right? And there are many, many mundane everyday advantages for men of this kind and disadvantages for women in diplomacy as a result. And this is also plausible, right? But this also faces objections, right? That perhaps most importantly, many women do have successful diplomatic careers. So how masculinized can diplomacy really be, right? So this is where the research stands today with two clusters of explanations that each does some work to explain why diplomacy is still so male dominated and full of gender patterns 50 years after the marriage bans were lifted. And the answers again to why there are gender patterns in diplomacy is likely a mix right of these four broad four broad sets of explanations. And the importance of each explanation likely varies, right, between ministries of foreign affairs and between the capitals or organizations where diplomats are posted. And so before we conclude, let me say a few things about how diplomacy may be masculinized and made to fit men. How might diplomacy be masculinized? Well, for one, it's important to remember, right, that the model diplomat the model diplomatic envoy of the 20th century was a heterosexual couple, right? Or more specifically, the model was a male diplomat and his wife. So historically, again, the diplomat was expected to be a man, right? He was ex also expected to bring a wife in the 20th century, and she was expected to do lots and lots of unpaid work on behalf of the embassy and, su and to support his career. She was expected to help organize dinners, luncheons, other functions. She was expected to network, and particularly with segments of society that the male uh, husband diplomat might not have access to. She was expected to be the eyes and the ears in other spheres. Right? She was also expected to take care of children uh, so that the male diplomat could devote himself fully to his job. And not least, she was expected to be willing to be able to follow her husband around the world to organize her life around him and his job. Right? So what happens when you place a woman in this kind of diplomatic role? Right? Well. Many husbands of female diplomats don't really behave the way that diplomatic wives do, right? Some are not willing to follow their wife to her postings. They don't really deploy internationally, often because they choose to pursue their own careers, right? And if they do, many men also opt out of the unpaid labor that's, ex that's expected of diplomatic wives. The diplomatic husbands don't really devote themselves to arranging luncheons and dinners and taking care of the children, right? And that means as that many women diplomats replace a couple, right? One woman is replacing two people. Women often have to play this dual role of diplomat and wife, right? 
So disproportionate number of women diplomats seem to be single and without children, which is most likely connected to the demands of the job. It's hard to find a husband willing to trail a wife's career. It's hard to combine family and a career as a diplomat for a woman, right? And here, I think it's interesting to think about new research from Australia. So in a research, in a recent dissertation, Dr. Lee Stevenson shows that Australian queer women, women with female partners, fared better than their heterosexual female colleagues in terms of meeting the demands of international deployment and the extraordinary requirements of diplomacy. Right? It was not that participants who had same-sex relationships were more equal, right, or the shade, shared paid and unpaired unpaid labor. Rather, it was that female spouses tended to be more engaged in managing diplomatic households and the informal functions that are a mainstay of diplomacy than male spouses tended to be. Wives of women diplomats also take care of children more than husbands of women dip diplomats do. Wives are thus really helpful for a diplomatic career, both for men and for women. And then a second way, that diplomacy is masculinized or expectations on dress and appearance. Again, this is modeled on men. The diplomatic uniform of today is a Western business suit, but not for women diplomats, right? The expectation on their appearance are different and more demanding. So they spend more time on their hair, makeup, clothes than male diplomats do, right? And they're expected not to wear the same clothes repeatedly, which often means they have to spend more time planning outfits, change several times during the day. I have done many, many interviews for my, for my research. I've been really taken aback, right, by how much stress some women ambassadors express around this dimension of dress and appearance. Right. And third, a third way that diplomacy is masculinized can be found in this established ways to network, right? Now I'm running out of time, so I will keep this short. But networking still often takes place in places that we were traditionally male spaces, right? In the golf course, at the bar, et cetera. And where some women diplomats feel perfectly comfortable in these social spaces, many indicate that they don't, right? It takes effort for them to insert themselves here, which means they have to work harder for access to central networking spaces. So these are but three ways in which diplomacy, the institutional diplomacy might be masculinized and there are multiple others, right? So what then can we expect ahead? Well, the full answer to I mean, where we're going depends on how we'll address these, the, these gender patterns, right? And the full answer to why there are gender patterns in diplomacy is likely a mix of factors, right? External and internal to diplomacy. But it's clear that it's not all external. Diplomatic institutions themselves need to change so that they don't continue to inadvertently be modeled on men, right? Making it more difficult for women to pursue a successful diplomatic career. And in this respect, again, uh, there's likely variation between ministries of foreign affairs. So each ministry for foreign affairs that aspires to meritocracy needs to do the work of figuring out, one, is there discrimination in our organization? What forms might that discrimination take? What kinds of changes do we need to initiate to eradicate gender discrimination? And two, each Ministry for Foreign Affairs needs to figure out how to make the diplomatic profession such that it doesn't require a diplomatic wife to do the job, right? And here I'm thinking of things like providing childcare provisions, perhaps split postings, uh, ways of making it easier for spouses to continue working, or any other measures that make it easier for diplomats to combine a career with family life, right? I'm also thinking of measures here to help single diplomats and particularly ambassadors perhaps to tasks that diplomatic wives might normally do. So figuring, figuring this out will benefit men as well, right? So this is a win-win. And in conclusion then, if the goal is a fully meritocratic foreign service where the most talented and hardworking individuals are allowed to thrive, then it's not sufficient simply to to lift bans and change rules so that women can enter diplomacy on terms that were set during the last century, right? More active work needs to be done. Thank you.